Ah, Ratchet and Clank A Crack in Time. What a beautiful game. To me, this game is top 5 best games ever. The gameplay is diverse, the story is great, there's just so much to do and for the PS3 era, this game just looks amazing. If I had to guess, I have beaten this game about 20 times over the years. Mostly on hardcore difficulty, obviously. So let's refresh this game. Let's find out if I can actually beat it while only using the wrench. As I think of the task at hand, I already feel some dread. There are especially a few boss battles that worry me. But let's see if that's justified. Can you beat Ratchet and Clank a crack in time on hardcore difficulty while only using the wrench? So let's establish the rules. Like I said, we will be playing on hardcore difficulty. The only problem with that is the damage output of the enemies. I know every corner of this game, so I can use that to my advantage. It's all about skill, and we will test that on the hardest difficulty. I also cannot buy weapons from vendors. We will have a starting gun, but we will not use it. The only weapon we can deal damage to enemies with is a wrench. And Clank's melee attacks obviously in some parts. But let me take a moment to tell you how the wrench works in this game, because it gives you a few options. Not many, but a few. First, there's a regular strike. Nothing special. Second, we can hyper strike. So if we jump and then slam our wrench down, we will deal more damage. Lastly, and most importantly, we can throw the wrench. This attack, <laughs> if we may call it that, makes a run possible in theory. It means that we can do damage while still keeping somewhat of a distance. Not buying weapons sounds easy, right? Well, it is in some cases. The beginning is, as almost always, kinda easy. The enemies we fight are Xyphoids. All the small ones are one-hit KOs, and the bigger ones are easy as well. We make our way through the Temple of Zan, pick up the Zoni vessel, and then Lord Vorsalan attacks the village. This is the first real combat section of the game. And I immediately found problems. See, even if we face the camera up, and we throw our wrench, the wrench will still fly the same path. So we cannot throw our wrench in the air, only a little bit if we jump while throwing it. I will call these enemies goons, because Quark calls them that sometimes. Some goons fly higher in the air than others, so it can be tricky to take them out. This village has some height advantages, so with a few good jumps and throws of your wrench, you will get through. And we make it here. So this is the first tank enemy of the game. So I tested a few strategies on him to get as much information. And what I found out is that when you hyper strike this tank, you can stun lock him for a short period of time. The tanks like a certain location for some reason. So I had to use this to my advantage. To be more precise, we will use this method a lot in this run. And that was all our business on Planet Quantos. We let the Zoni repair our ship and... Okay. Ta -da. But all is not good. Quark got captured. So we have to free him from Vorslan's warship. But boarding the ship is a problem. You see, you cannot board the ship if you don't take out these enemy fighters. And you have to do this, there is no other way. Literally. I knew the Zoni can give your ship a shield upgrade. So I thought we have to get enough Zoni so we can ricochet our attacks using a shield and kill them without firing. But unfortunately, the moons become inaccessible while Vorsalon is in this sector. On top of that, I would later find out that you must have like 18 to 22 Zoni to get this shield upgrade. So there's no way we are getting that anytime soon. That means we have to fire. Bad, right? I know. But I made a deal with myself. I will only take out hostile ships if I absolutely must kill it in order to progress. That and I will only use missiles instead of blasters and missiles. 
This makes this part a little bit harder. I personally do not consider this challenge lost because we did not fire Ratchet's guns. Anyway, we use the gravity boots and get to this mini tutorial. You can see that three enemies can transform into one goon. That will be a concerning point in this run, because sometimes, take this part for example, lots of enemies enter the battle at the same time, and I cannot stop all their conversions. That's really unfortunate, but not right now, this part is still really easy. And then we get here. Ooh, this is where the fun begins. Quark slams this door in, and all enemies start attacking us. My first run went... Uh, not so good. See, the enemies here are easy. Just dodge their attacks and throw your wrench at them constantly. But if you get further, you might see the problem. The bridge is out. And these enemies are out of reach for our wrench to hit them. Don't even bother trying to stand on the barricade here, it won't work. So I started to panic. Is this run over right here? In this random hallway? One thing I also noticed is that Quark was nowhere to be found. For some reason he stayed behind. That's unfortunate because if he were to hit his shots, he could actually do some damage. But I kept trying and eventually died. So in my second run, Quark did in fact move forward. So I thought let him kill all the enemies. Uh, no. He targeted the tank all the way in the back. I'm not sure, but let's say he even does damage this far away. That's negligible. So that tank won't die. But after a few tries, I found out that you can in fact get the bridge out. I don't know why, but when those enemies are alive, it takes perfect positioning. But surely possible. After that, I only died a few times and made it through the end. Phew, dodged a bullet there. The battle against Lord Vorsalon himself took me two tries. But don't let that fool you, this battle is quite difficult. But I will talk in more detail about him later in the run. The first battle against Vorsalon means he's kinda slow, so it's doable. I'll be back, Vorsalon. For now, I will explore a few moons. The Great Clock Sector 2 and destroy the hypersonic brainwave scrambler. I find the path to the hollow, help end code 1113, find General Azimuth and finish the hoverboat training. Nothing noteworthy really happens. Until Axiom City. <laughs> Here we can buy our first armor upgrade. This game is going to get much harder ongoing, so every armor upgrade we can get is very welcome. So we equip the Ectoflux armor and we make it to Nurox Plaza. This part takes really long. I wouldn't say it's difficult or anything, but you have to stay sharp. It's easy to get hit a few times and die. That means you have to restart again. In this run I got lucky. My nanotech increased. This is something to keep in mind. Once your experience reaches a certain threshold, your max nanotech will increase and your lives get fully restored. A nice bonus, but not something to count on, because that will only happen a few times in the whole game. On Nurox Plaza, something troubling happens. At one point, two tanks enter the battlefield. Now that's a slight problem because we can only focus hyper strikes on one of them. And the other one is always going to attack. I found that if you stand behind one, the other one will try to target you and shoot the first one. Great tactic, make them kill each other. But when we fast forward to Pollux Industries, we find the same scenario, but this time it's in a tight hallway. I was kinda nervous because I did not know what to do. In the end, I decided to get behind them, which was the right call. They won't expect this and they will constantly try to face forward. Once you get behind them, just bash away. I wouldn't say that this strategy is a guarantee win because I did fail a few times, but after that, it's your best call. So far the run has only had a few minor inconveniences. Is this run even worth making a video about? Well, yes. Oh my god. <laughs> we are about to fight the VX99. 
And while this battle is usually not a problem, in this run, a total nightmare. I will even go as far as to say that battling the VX99 while only using the wrench will rank in the top 15 most difficult bosses I have ever done in gaming history. Oh my god! Everything about this fight is awful. And let me tell you why. First, look at how his blaster shoots. He shoots like a madman. Total wildfire everywhere. But we can just keep jumping to the left or right, right? No, because every few seconds he will change direction. And that means that you are going to jump in his blaster fire and gain damage. You have to jump very carefully here. But also, let's not forget to do damage to him. While we jump, we can keep throwing our wrench and hit him, resulting into very little damage. So we have to hit him quite a lot. There is kind of a perfect distance between you and him. I would say at about 3 meters give or take. That is just a range for your wrench to hit him and keep somewhat of a safe distance. Obviously, it cannot be more than 3 meters because then your wrench won't hit him. But 3 meters, okay right? Mm, you will also know that this is an estimate. So when we keep jumping from the left to the right, eventually we will get closer and get hit by his blasters. But okay, th <laughs> this is only problem one. You might have already noticed problem number two. The electrical floor. And that's a really big problem. Getting hit by those energy beams will cost additional damage, obviously. And since we keep jumping left or right, sometimes there is nothing we can do. Because we have to evade his blaster fire Eventually, you will have no choice but to land in his energy beam. So, more damage. <laughs> Great! One run I had fairly early on is worth mentioning. I think this was like my sixth attempt or so. I made quite a bit of progress but also gained much damage obviously. But then my nanotech increased, bringing me all the way to max. This has to be the run, I thought. Don't let this opportunity go to waste. But, since he deals so much damage and I'm still figuring out strategies, there was no way. I died again. This made it even worse for me because more and more I lost hope that I would actually be able to do this. But I can keep on trying to defeat him, eventually my nanotech will increase, right? Well, you are not entirely wrong, but let me bring up footage from an hour later. Yes. At this point I've battled the VX99 for over an hour now. Look at how my nanotech has increased since. Not even 20% I think. This just doesn't work. I have to grind the VX99, damn that feels weird to say, in order to get only one chance with more lives. So that's still no guarantee. <sighs> but let me tell you about problem number 3. His trapping ability. He will stop firing his blasters for a short period of time, so he can force me into a certain area. And if you don't gain damage from this already, it's very hard to see where the electrical ground beams are. So a lot of times, you will get hit by one of them as well. Damn you VX99! <laughs> In rare times, the game also makes this battle harder. Sometimes the game will register your wrench throw as a hyper strike. So you will hyperstrike right into electrical ground beams. Man, this boss fight is insane. After an hour and a half of doing the same thing on the same platform, I did get him pretty low, which was great. But my lives also got low. I got kind of nervous, but I'm like, no, I'm unable to do this. But then he blew up and I survived on nine health. Wow, at these times I wish I recorded live reactions because damn, this was really intense. And I can finally continue. We move on to the Great Clock Sector 3, nothing interesting here. And we fight Libra in the space battle. Now this battle cost me a little over half an hour because of my no shooting rule. Missiles come out really slow and they really don't do so much damage. 
Twice in this battle, Libra's ship becomes unable to fire and hit. So we have to take out hostile ships. But they shoot a lot, resulting into damage. On the plus side, with every kill, there's a small chance that they drop additional lives. While gaining lives results into plus 10 health, but every hit I take results into 30 damage, that means Nanotech has to spawn 3 times in the entire battle to negate only one shot. So the damage adds up. I also don't get why they had to put this fight first and Karina second. She's just so much easier. In fact, I won't even mention her later. You know, that is if we make it that far. <laughs> For now we kill Libra and head to the Kral Canyon, planet Lumos. Now Kral Canyon gets attacked by Agorians and we have to take out 5 Agorian riders. It's not so hard. Just keep somewhat of a safe distance and throw your wrench to eventually take them out. In fact, I'd say the real troubles are the additional enemies that also shoot at you while you are going to attack the riders. So I scout Kral Canyon to find every last health box available. And this gives me time to tell you about enemy classes. So Agorians and Nefarious' goons both have same enemy types. Obviously by now I have a strategy for all of them. However, sometimes it's somewhat dependent of the situation. There are these guys who melee at you. Here the strategy is always simple, just keep running away while strafing and that means you can keep a safe distance while facing forward and you can keep throwing your wrench. Then there are also enemies who will stay in the back and shoot bombs. I will call these guys shooters and guys who are all the way in the back lancers. And they can be very tricky. They mostly attack while you are attacking someone else and you get an unexpected hit. Most of the times I make them a priority over the other enemies. These lancers are just very annoying. There are also a few more Nefarious goons, but we'll get to that. Alright, back to fighting the riders. The trick here is to attack and once your lives get low, you hunt the Zoni right here. Capturing a Zoni will restore your lives to full. With that, and while hunting every health box, I thought I had a chance. But look at this stupid mistake. I fell off the map. For no reason. I was really scared I had to try everything again, but luckily the game saves after every rider who was taken out. And every health box respawns. So yeah, it takes some time, but you'll get through. We fight the Hydra tanks who are a bit tricky, but nothing we can't handle with the special skills we've developed by now. Now after that the game forces me into this turret. And we have to fire this, there is no way around. If you do nothing, eventually you will die and you cannot leave the turret. Not that I would be interested in killing Ariel's ship with a melee wrench, but still. It's still not Ratchet's gun, so I decide to use the same rules as the space battle. I only fired missiles here, and we make it through. The way to Vulcrum Star is not worth mentioning, and we will skip right over that to the Agorian Battleplex. Now Captain Quark was captured again and we have to win the bronze tournament to save him. I was kinda scared for this part actually. I forgot what challenges were in this tournament. Maybe even one where firing weapons is necessary. But no, that's the silver or the bronze cup, which are optional. So there is a theoretical way to make it work, but don't let that fool you. This is still quite hard. There is an upside though. We can now buy the Thermoflux armor, which is much needed. Especially for two courses in the Bronze Cup. The first one being the Armageddon one. It's very easy to gain extra damage from the fire or the flying blades. It will maybe take you a few tries. The second one is the Death from Above challenge, where you have to throw bombs back. In my first run, eventually the Agorians stopped throwing their bombs, resulting into a loss. And I got kind of scared. But after a few tries, they threw them again and I could win, luckily. Only thing left is defeating the war croc with only the wrench. And I've done this several times over the years, nothing hard about it. Just keep running away while strafing and look forward. Just throw your wrench like a hundred times and we are able to win the bronze cup. 
Be aware that we will win the negotiator weapon here. We won't use it, but that's why you will see the negotiator icon on the top left screen sometimes. Quite a lazy price, right? For a guy who won't use guns. The next stop is the Tombly outpost, Planet Xenophar. Which is usually pretty easy. Except for this one part where we have to free the Fongoids. In this run, obviously, it's quite hard. <laughs> and that is due to a few reasons. The biggest being the Lancers in the back. I call them Lancers because they throw their bombs from a distance. We are getting into that part of the game where these guys are going to be a problem. Their bombs will always follow you until they hit the ground. That makes ground combat against meleeers or shooters much harder. I decided to make them a priority. But that is way easier said than done. The simple reason being, they are higher than you are. We cannot throw our wrench up. But if we jump and then throw our wrench, we will take damage from the Lancers. Let me also say that I usually rush past this part while going back to the vendor, refilling ammo, and when you do, you gain back all of your lives. That is my usual strat. But in this run, that's not possible, because we cannot buy weapons. We won't fire, so we cannot buy ammo. That means we have to do this with the health bar we have. I've tried this part multiple times, and you have to get kinda lucky. After these enemies, there's a second wave coming. In my successful run, I made the Lancers a priority and hyper striked them to death. I did take a lot of damage, but after almost dying, I went back to collect every health box available. I made it, but then the energy field lowers and two tanks waltz right in. It was a risk, because I didn't know what would happen, but I found out that these guys are actually skippable. And the reward is great, a Zoni, which refills all of our lives. The rest of this planet is very doable. I will give a quick mention to these two rooms, which took me like half an hour, but the AI is very predictable here. The strategy here is to go for the tank while you evade all enemy fire. And once he's dead, you will clean up the rest. Well, we did come a long way already. And I'm proud of how good we're doing. We've completed both planets in the Corthos sector. So, on to the next sector, right? Um, no. You forgot something. Lord Vorsalon captures General Azimuth and we have to free him. Now this is not fun at all. Everything about this level sucks in this run. So we land in the hangar and this is immediately one of our biggest problems. The hangar is roaming with enemies. On my first attempt, I did not even last 30 seconds. 30 seconds? What the hell am I running into now? I'm walking into hell. That's what this is. Okay, so the beginning is awful, because of all the little bots who can convert into goons. With so many goons, sooner or later, you will get lots and lots of damage. The hard part about this hangar part is the fact that it's very unpredictable. There are a lot of enemies of each type, all resulting into different problems. The meleeers follow you, while the lancers attack you from the back, and these guns who shoot energy beams will make strafing a lot harder for you. When you finally defeat lots and lots of enemies, two tanks come in. And I actually managed to defeat them on my first try. I notice that they follow me, so I separate them. I can use the hyper strike tactic on the first one, putting it in stun lock while the second one is not in my vision, so he can target me. Once he's dead, go for the second one and finish it. This hangar part took me just 40 minutes. Just. Because we are going to fight Lord Vorsalon. Oh man, this dude is insane. Remember last time he wasn't such a problem, right? Well, the boss fight is kind of the same. But he is way deadlier, faster and smarter this time around. All we can do is throw our wrench. But as you know by now, we have to stand kind of close to him while doing this. And this is very dangerous for a guy with this many lives and attacks this deadly. There are a few things he can do. The most common attack is him throwing an energy beam at you. 
this attack will be the best for doing damage to him. Once you have positioned yourself perfectly, you have to jump away in time and throw your wrench a few times. Then there's also this attack. He makes like a net on the ground. I kept losing life to this attack, and this attack made me realize I have to plan my wrench throws. I want to throw it all the time. I mean, it already takes so long to kill him, why wait, right? Well, because otherwise you just simply die. <laughs> So after losing 3 runs to this attack, I decided to never attack Vorsalon when he does this. So I have time to escape and not gain damage. That's the most important thing in this battle. Survival. Not doing damage, survival. Because there are more things Vorsalon can do. He can make energy beams follow you on the ground. Which is unfortunate because this mostly happens when you are attacking him and you can't get away in time. One more attack he can do is an attack where he shoots, uh, let's say, barricades of energy and you have to evade it. This one is not so hard, but sometimes you have yourself perfectly lined up to attack him and you have to relocate again because of this. Man, this part. One last attack he has is turning invisible, but this one is actually quite beneficial to us. It's the best move he can use. He will hunt you, appear at a random time and punch you. But if he just keep running away, he will never get that chance. Also, when he does this, these things appear in the wall. And if we pull the bolts out, he freezes. Giving you a few seconds to attack him at will. Which is great. I calculated that you can hyper strike him exactly 7 times before he unfreezes again. And yes, it took 9 attempts to calculate this perfectly. So yeah, Vorslan. I knew it had to be possible if I were to stay sharp and have enough patience. I had this one run where I died while I was kinda close, which broke my heart. He just does too much damage on hardcore difficulty. So we can only get hit for like 10 times before we die. And getting hit is very common actually. This boss takes a lot of skill and patience. So after a very long time, I finally had a very close run where I beat Lord Vorsalan on only two health remaining. That is one shot. Whew. Time to catch some air. I did it. It is over. Lord Vorsalan is defeated. Only thing left to do is free Azimuth and escape. Well, Hold your horses. We may have finally defeated Vorsalon, but that is nowhere near the hard part. The hard part is about to begin. The escape. Oh my god. This is awful. Really awful. So we are back in the hangar again. The game suggests that we use a turret here, but we won't do that, right? It's wrench time. <sighs> well. At spawn, one tank and four goons walk into the battlefield. You can take out the tank with hyper strikes, but the shooters have most likely hit you with their bullets by now, so you will take damage. But that's not even the problem. The problem is that they always fly to the same location, and that location is all the way up there. So I've tried so much, and there is a theoretical way to do damage to three of the four from this box, but that is never going to work, because there are many, many bullets flying. Oh, and let's not forget that you sometimes take damage from the bombs located in this hangar. There are two health boxes here. And yes, they help, but not nearly enough. There is no practical way to kill all four of these enemies. And even if we did, we cannot continue, because there are few more waves of enemies coming. I did notice that the next wave will always start when there are exactly two enemies remaining of the first wave. Having this knowledge is great for planning and picking my most ideal position. But nowhere near enough. In wave 2, another two tanks enter the battlefield with many more goons. I did try two runs where I waited out every attack of the tank back in the map and only attacked when he reloads. 
Great plan, but the shooters will still kill you. This battleship is just insane. Oh hey, there's more. In wave 3, two dropships enter the hangar. And they will shoot bombs so big that you almost always get hit by them. But in most runs, we don't even make it that far. So let's go back to wave 1. Now, I did have a strategy. See, the spawn of the shooters is on the ground. After that they fly up. So what if I killed them before they could make it that far? Let's try that. When they spawn in, I immediately throw my wrench into the bomb to the left. That means with one more wrench throw, the first one will die. Now the timer starts. I have to kill one more enemy before they make it to their spot. I would usually succeed. Maybe we can kill number 3 and 4, right? No, you really can't. Really, there is not enough time. But the biggest reason is that in the meantime, the tank position himself and will open fire at you. That means when you have defeated the second shooter, you will have to target the tank, otherwise the damage will be too great. When done perfectly, I will survive with two shooters remaining. And this means that the next wave would start, and more goons face up, with two more tanks guarding the perimeter. Yeah, so I've talked about Lord Vorsalon for a few minutes now, but I have to say, Lord Vorsalon's battleship made me want to give up on this run. It took so long and there was no practical way of defeating everything with only a wrench. Especially the last part, because in the rest there was a theoretical way of beating it without shooting. But here, no, I'm just not sure. And I take way too much damage. Be aware that I've now spent my entire afternoon in Lord Vorsalon's warship. I'm about to lose my mind. It wasn't my strategy, I knew that. I have tried everything. And the ones I went with would usually give me the same results, despite getting unlucky sometimes. So is this run failed? I do see one option, and that is to use the turret. I mean, it's kind of cheating, right? Well, maybe. But this is literally my only way if I will continue this run. I mean, it's not from my gun, so maybe it's somewhat okay? I don't know, probably not. So if you consider this run over, I get that. But after hours upon hours of doing the same part over and over and over again, I dealt with it. In my final run, I used the turret. Only missiles, obviously. I won in 70 seconds. It is literally that easy. All that time I will never get back. But I do get a reward. Getting to leave Varsalon's ship to hopefully never return. Next is the last section of the Great Clock with the hardest puzzles. And they are great. Good level design and very fun to do. And we land on Vapedia, blah blah blah, Valkyries, battery bots, blah blah, split up, death traps, blah blah blah, and we fight Cassiopeia. Now, I have to admit, I did start this run already thinking this run would be impossible. Because of this fight. Why? Because we are in the air and she has a flying machine. No way our wrench would be able to reach her, right? Well, as I come to know, it's not quite impossible. Only very obscure and very unlikely. See, Cassiopeia has four things she can do. The first one is this. She comes somewhat close to the platform and she starts shooting acid bombs. It does take some time for the bombs to reach your platform, so you can actually position yourself on the edge of the platform. And with the perfect position and jump, you are just able to inflict damage onto her. But there is a lot that can go wrong, obviously. Acid bombs can hit you, or way worse, you can fall off. I had a few runs where throwing my wrench was registered as a hyperstrike, and then ratchet moves forward, hyperstriking into oblivion. Good job, Ratchet. Wasting my time 101. Thank you. The second attack Cassiopeia uses is also a waste of your time. She will bomb your entire platform with acid bombs. 
you will not be able to hit her during this attack. The third thing that can happen is her keeping her distance and firing her machine gun. You would think this sucks because you cannot hit her during this time. And you are right about this, but after this attack, the next thing that will happen 100% of the time is that her flying machine will crash at a convenient place. It's your job to anticipate this and go to the left or right and keep smashing your wrench into her. That leads into more damage than the usual. Don't get me wrong, it's still very little, but some damage. Now, in my successful run, Yes, there was a successful run. This boss fight went on for so long that my game glitched all the way. This boss is intended to kill in, let's say, 4 to 5 minutes. I did it in 27. Only my successful run. Because of this, the game gets super confused and will start to forget to turn certain animations on and off. So her minigun would not display all bullets. The marks of the acid bombs wouldn't disappear and my hover boots never stopped boosting. This made me really nervous because I did not want to start over. And one mistake and I fall into oblivion. But after this run of 27 minutes, I defeated Cassiopeia. And I think it only took me like 4 or 5 attempts. Very good because like I said, during this whole run I thought that this part would be impossible. I am rewarded with my last help of the run, time bombs. Because we are reunited with the senior caretaker of the great clock, we can throw time bombs to help us battle with our wrench. They will make enemies move slower in a small bubble. Much needed because there are very hard parts coming up. Brace yourself. We land on the outer perimeter of Nefarious' space station and almost immediately come to this spot. <laughs> Now, I don't know what to say about this one. You have noticed that for the last while, things got pretty tough. Now, this is a random hallway that is very hard. There are three shooters in the way. That is not a big deal, only slightly annoying. When we start attacking, a dropship will come, spawning in four melayers and two lancers. On top of that, the dropship will stay where he is and he can attack us as well with his big guns. So there are bullets and bombs flying everywhere. The upside is that they also do damage to each other, but not nearly enough. After approximately 7 tries, I knew that if I wanted to have somewhat of a chance, I needed to kill the lancers in the back before they can attack. Now, why is this? When I start attacking the meleeers or the shooters, Bombs of the Lancers are devastating. They will follow me through the air and I will lose plenty of lives. So I came up with somewhat of a valuable strategy. When the dropship comes and spawns in the Lancers, I make them priority number one. I wait until they've chosen their spot and then hyper strike them so they hopefully fall into outer space. If that was to happen, I instantly got rid of them. But a lot can go wrong in this process. The Lancers can attack you obviously, but also the dropship will spawn in those meleeers I mentioned. And if I get the one hit KO on the Lancers, which will happen sometimes, the meleeers will team up on me and try to rape me. <laughs> yeah, they will. Also, let's not forget that the dropship is close and will shoot bombs who do massive damage. But I do make progress with this strategy. Or you know, my run would instantly end, which saves time. But what I would also do is throw time bombs. It depends on your position, but if possible, I will throw a time bomb onto a dropship. That will slow his bombs down, giving me a better opportunity. Now this was unlikely to happen, but in the end, I did it. I had a near perfect run. I killed the shooters and the lancers with zero damage taken. That was very unlikely. I used time bombs to kill the meleeers from much distance of the dropship and then killed him with the wrench time bomb strategy. And I've made it. This took me 45 minutes, just this hallway. So I was very relieved. I continued and saved here. Now I stopped playing for the day and continued the next day. 
but my spawn would reset. And I was very scared because that meant I had to redo that part again. But I saw that the slingshot targets were still active, so I could rush right through. But that got me suspicious. Weren't these there yesterday? I checked my footage. Here, this is footage from one of my first attempts. There they are! They are there! That means I've spent much time getting annoyed and figuring out strategy for a hallway that is easily skippable. <laughs> okay, well, let's stay focused. Because we're going to make it right here. And did you think 45 minutes for one hallway was long? Mwah, how about two hours for one room? Yep, that's how long it took me to get past this room. There are just too many things that can go wrong. And that is due to a few things. First, there are two shooters and a tank. I did notice that more enemies will spawn in while only one of these guys are alive. So ideally, the tank would have died by now, but Quark also shoots at this time. He actually does okay damage for an NPC. That's a big upside. Another upside is that enemies will sometimes target him instead of you, which is great. But the downside is that it's way harder to strategize. If Quark kills more enemies than you would like, the enemies will spawn in at bad timings. You won't be ready for them. But okay, Wave 2 has two Lancers again. And the same problem as before occurs right here. If I want to have any chance of pulling this off, I have to take them out first. Yep, they sometimes get even more priority than tags, which is mind-blowing to me. That's how annoying they are. So I would die over and over again. In wave 3, two tanks and many goons spawn in. The problem being that they will open fire at you and you can only stunlock one of them. And let's not forget that the shooters will also shoot bullets and the meleeers will try to rape you. <laughs> in wave 2 and 3 there are also small droids. So if you are not fast enough, they can convert into an extra goon. But that's also if. Because if you are in the middle of stun locking a tank, you cannot abandon this task. The tank will reposition and kill you. The strategy here is nothing more than this. Stun lock tanks whenever possible, run away as many times as you can, make the lances a priority, and get as lucky as you possibly can. Literally, that's the strat. In my successful attempt, I survived on 5 health after 2 hours. I literally cannot tell you why this attempt worked and others didn't. Luck is just a big factor here. And with 5 health remaining, I would die in the next hallway. But I did got a checkpoint, luckily. So this hallway is a bit difficult because the two tanks, but I did get past them after 15 minutes or so. I tried to let Quark kill some enemies, but they didn't seem to take damage from him anymore. Anyway, make a run for it, dodge your attacks and be aggressive. You'll make it. And we get to go to the next room. <laughs> so yeah, you might have noticed a trend in the hard parts, right? It's always tanks and lancers. Now let's see what this room has to bring. Well, you alright? Four tanks and two lancers. What? How the fuck am I going to do this? How much time will this cost? 20 minutes. Tops. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Shocking. See, Quark is a big target for the tanks. And they will lock onto him most of the time. That means we just keep bashing away. But there are more upsides and downsides that apply here. The downside is that you cannot make the Lancers a priority this time. Small droids will spawn in and convert into a new Lancer. Unfortunate, but you can account for this with the upside, and that is that the entire ship has opened up by now. So every time my lives get low, I can backtrack the entire station and fill my lives with the health boxes in the last two rooms. Great! So this room is a bit difficult? but really doable in compared to the last two rooms. I will transform into Nefarious and I will get the option to ANNIHILATE 
all enemies. I have to fight them later, so the less the better. We get into this fighting scene and it's not so hard actually. You will beat this in a few tries. Nefarious flings us out on an asteroid and we land in the last sector, in Ginlik Valley, planet Morklon. Sigmund opens a time portal, right into the battle of Ginlik Valley. The Agorians are attacking the valley and we have to help the Fungoids save the floodgate. First of all, I have good news. The Hyperflux armor is available for sale now. That means I can get hit more while still surviving. And we need that, because look at how many Agorians are only in the middle area. There are more on the left side and many more will spawn in. I don't know why, but it was really fun to develop strategies for this battle. Like this one. Most of the time, an Agorian rider will immediately run up to you. Now usually, we take out the dog thing, whatever, and then we fight the rider itself. But I found out a glitch. See, when I throw a time bomb and kill the dog thing in this area, the Agorian just despawns. And this is not a one-time thing. No, this happened consistently. For some reason, the Agorian AI gets confused when messing with time. One other big strategy I had to figure out was how to approach so many enemies. Will I go through the middle, on the left, on the right, from the above right here, or start left and make my way right? There's a lot of different approaches here. It took me a lot of trial and error, but in the end I set my mind on the right side and make my way left. This was obviously the better play. This will mean that there is a wall in my back, so I cannot take fire from that side. All Agorians would line up their fire to murder me, but actually damage each other. It is prominent that you use the Vorsalon tactic here, that is, inflict as much damage as possible, but only when it's safe. So it's better to save your lives than to get that extra damage inflicted. I also noticed that when the first line of defense has been breached, you can consistently kill the meleeers on this platform. You sometimes have to jump away in time, but you will be safe most of the time. Just be careful of the bullets of the shooters and the lancers in the back. Also be careful of a dropship, which does not only spawn more enemies, but will also fire a few times before leaving the battlefield. This did cost me three runs. Anyway, with the go right and evade as much as possible strategy, after like an hour, you will clear this. But it's not over. Because we have to free Zahn Gripneck, who's locked up in the back over there. Two Agorians with shields are blocking our way. But the annoying part about this is the Lancer again. I would hoverboot right through the shield guys and take out the Lancer as fast as possible. And we're free! Right? Right? Aww. There are more ways. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I also lost 4 runs in this wave. Meaning I have to start the entire battle of Gimlik Valley all over again. So after spending an hour and a half in this valley, I figured out that throwing time bombs is the best strategy in this platform. It's still nerve-wracking because every attempt takes like 10 minutes to get here and your lives are low. But when you follow this strategy, in the end you will be successful. It's your best bet. Hydra tanks spawn in and this is just funny. They just break when you throw a time bomb at them. Their AI will stop working normally. Therefore, they are really easy. I think I beat them on my second try. Alright, we plant vines. We ride the vines in the present and use the time portal to make it on the floodgate. And this is where Commander Argos attacks us in his battleship. Yeah, a flying battleship with high class defenses and shooting capabilities against a noob with the melee wrench. Let's just say the odds are not really in our favor. So let's talk about how this is going to work. How are we going to inflict damage? It's really obscure, but in the first phase, Argo swaps location. He can either go left, go middle, or go right. He positions himself 
then attacks. When we are on the edge of the platform and throw our wrench, we can hit him and inflict some damage. It's awful to see how little damage this is, but it's all we can do. We will dodge its attacks, and when it's safe, we have just a tiny opening to throw your wrench. I wanted to calculate how many hits I have to get him to only defeat phase 1, but I really don't like doing that right now. <laughs> My estimate is that you have to hit him somewhere around 80 to 100 times with your wrench to defeat only the first phase. But when you battle Argos for, you know, <laughs> let's say two hours straight. In the end I got a few runs where I mastered his pattern and defeated Argos phase 1 without taking any damage. Okay, then on to phase 2. And it gets a little more confusing here. There are now two things that he can do. He can shoot as normal, given a little more aggressive, or he can shoot three bombs that will follow you. You see, not much chance. On top of that, in between attacks, he will now hide below your platform, which makes him impossible to hit. The only chance we get to inflict damage is when he throws bombs. But you have to be close and he will throw his bombs near you. Every time you make a hit, which is possible but unlikely, you will jump onto a bomb and gain damage. But I thought of something else. Time bombs. Let me just say that Argos is immune to time bombs. And that's stupid actually. Otherwise our chances would be just a little bit higher. No, they don't work on him. But they do work on his bombs. So my strategy is this. I throw a time bomb onto the edge of the platform. Run up to him, jump, throw my wrench, hopefully hit him, this is not guaranteed. Just jump away in time for the bomb gets to you. Do you see how unlikely this is? It just wouldn't work. Also remember that he will use bombs. Bombs and then fire his gun. So from these three attacks, you will only have one chance to hit him once. And that is if you are lucky. The time it will take to only complete this phase is 25 minutes. Let me just say there's no checkpoint in between phases. The first phase takes like 10 minutes. The second phase would be something like 25 minutes of you throwing your wrench at very inconvenient times. And this entire time you can take damage. And that's not unlikely to happen. Not unlikely at all, actually it's very common. I was surprised if I had a 3 streak while I inflicted damage without getting hit back. Yeah, this is not working out. There's just no way to inflict damage to him constantly and not getting hit. And I have tried everything, literally. It sucks, because after this there are only two more boss fights until we finish the game. But after three hours of battling Argos with only the wrench, I knew I was beat. And there was no way that you can beat him with only the wrench. Be aware that there's also a phase three where he gets even more aggressive and throws five bombs per run instead of three. Argos is literally unbeatable with only the wrench. So let's answer the question. Can you beat Ratchet and Clank a crack in time on hardcore while only using the wrench? As much as it pains me to say, no, you can't. And you know, we can't take a loss and still finish the game, right? No. I didn't realize this, but I've actually soft locked myself. See, after three hours of battling Argos, I decided to use weapons, but I only have two. A level 1 negotiator, which is actually pretty okay, and a level 1 constructor pistol. Now ammo will respawn when you get low on ammo, but the game heavily prefers giving ammo for constructor guns. As a matter of fact, in the half hour I battled Argos with weapons, I only got negotiator rockets twice. And the constructor pistol is a level 1 starting gun. It just does no damage. Really. Look at me firing 15 rounds. Did you see his health bar? 
drop for only a millimeter? I didn't. If I do damage, it's only one point of damage and that is nowhere near enough to have any chance of beating Argos. And I doubt it really does damage. I seriously doubt if the damage is set to zero. Okay, so combine all this. I cannot finish this run. Quite unfortunate. But the only two parts remaining are the battle against Nefarious, which would also be impossible or at the very least really unlikely, and the battle against Azimuth. And I will say, if you manage to defeat General Azimuth with only your wrench on hardcore difficulty only once, I will buy you pie. Or something. <laughs> Battling Azimuth with the wrench would be a nightmare. I was also planning on trying the optional fight against Lord Varsalon, but I'm really glad I don't have to injure myself like that. So, yeah, not much left for me to say. I really hope you liked that run. Now, would I recommend this run? Eh, not really. The fun about Ratchet and Clank is the weapons and leveling them up, trying different playstyles with various weapons. If you were to take that away, your options would be very limited, which is frustrating. If you like a challenge like I do, yeah, maybe give it a shot. Just know that this game is unbeatable with only the wrench. This has been yet another obscure video game run, so until next time I'd say, take care. Yeah. Yeah.